But we can help. There's a lot of ways that we can help. And, and nature really needs help right now. Uh, and so Tom's going to give a talk about that. And just as, as part of introduction, Tom was a little concerned when I talked to him last week that people might confuse, because he's our board chair, that his presentation is the Northeast Wilderness Trust's presentation. And you know this comes from his day job, as he said. And he said, you wanna, so my job here is to distance myself from Tom <laughs> and his talk. Uh, but what I told him when we talked, I, I said, you know, he said, I'm not speaking for you when I'm giving this presentation. I said, well, you're speaking for us, though. I mean, these are threats to the, to the places that we love. So when you're ri raising the uh, awareness of folks about, about what our addiction to energy is doing to our planet and what it's likely to do in the future, you are speaking for us. You're speaking for the things we care about. Uh, and so it's with great affection and appreciation that uh, I give you Tom Butler. So disclaimer finished. Let's talk about Henry David Thoreau. 168 years ago, he lived in this neighborhood in a small, uh, rustic, handmade <coughs> structure. And he spent most of his days rambling about in nature, thinking very deeply about freedom and wildness and the way that human domestication of the landscape compromised, compromised those values. Now, we, of course, trace uh, the intellectual lineage of the wilderness movement in the United States very much to Henry David Thoreau and his thinking. But he was hardly the first person to think about those things. About 24 centuries before Henry David Thoreau lived in this neighborhood, a gentleman lived in the woods in China in a small, uh, rustic, handmade shelter, and he spent much of his day uh, rambling about in nature, thinking very deeply about freedom and wildness and the way that human <coughs> domestication of the landscape affected those values. That poet wrote, as for those who would take the whole world to tinker as they see fit, I observe that they never succeed. For the world is a sacred vessel, not made to be altered by man, the tinker will spoil it, usurpers will lose it. The tinker will spoil it, usurpers will lose it. What is it to usurp? To usurp something, it is to seize or make a claim on power that's illegitimate. I know of no more perfect encapsulation of the human project on planet Earth right now, or at least the attitude of modern humanity. So for the next about three minutes, I'm going to show you some images of the way that our current energy economy is spoiling the Earth.
you didn't catch that lyric, that repeating lyric, it says, you already know how this will end. I think everyone in this room certainly knows how it will end if the current trajectory of the energy economy is not changed. And it won't be a pretty future for nature or for people. Now, the current energy economy, of course, is based on drilling platforms and pipelines and power lines and all kinds of transmission infrastructure. But more than that, it's fundamentally based on an idea. It's a powerful idea. That is that the world is merely a collection of resources for human use. And essentially that means that nothing is sacred, not the wild rivers of Chilean Patagonia, which a consortium of utilities would really like to dam up, not the ancient curves and folds of Appalachia, which uh, mountain by mountain are being de decapitated so that coal can remain cheap, and certainly not the health of our communities or even the lungs of our children. Nothing is sacred. Now, when we see an image like this of tar sands uh, development in Alberta, you know, the toxic nature of the energy economy is obvious. It's really readily apparent. But we, for the most part, don't see all of this energy-related infrastructure and extraction that is behind all of the, the services and the products that we use every day. Everything that we do depends upon a cheap, abundant supply of energy. In fact, energy, of course, supports the entire scaffolding of civilization. And in something of a positive feedback loop, it now takes that entire scaffolding to maintain those systems of extraction and refining and power generation and transmission, all of those systems that get the juice to us, that get the liquid fuels to us, that keeps the modern growth society humming along. So to get a f clear understanding of this new era of extreme energy, I'm going to just run through um, a little bit of Energy Literacy 101, which is the first section of the book, so that we have a better understanding, we have a common, common frame of reference here for this conversation. It takes energy to produce energy. And the net, the amount that's left over that's readily deployable to society for useful work, is the important criterion. Now, I'm sure everybody has seen a, uh, an old movie sometime where some scruffy prospector with a cowboy boot kind of scuffs his toe across the West Tex Texas desert and up comes a gusher. Well, that may be uh, fanciful, but in fact, in the early days of the oil era, it was much, much easier to get a return on that investment. In fact, estimates are that it was something like a 100, to 100 and plus to one net energy ratio. That is, the energetic equivalent of a single barrel of oil invested gets you more than 100 back. Now, today, conventional oil production is down to about 20 to one net energy ratio. Uh, for unconventional oil derived from shale oil formations or from, from uh, oil sands or tar sands, certainly less, certainly less with offshore oil drilling as well. And an energy resource, of course, is not going to be particularly helpful once it gets down to a fairly low net energy ratio. It takes you as much energy investment to get out the energy that you've produced. It's not particularly useful. In the case of um, corn-derived ethanol, some estimates that are that it's even a negative net energy ratio. A little better for sugarcane derived ethanol. Now this modern industrial society that we live in looks a lot about of the way it does because of the miraculous nature of fossil energy. Fossil fuels are incredibly energy dense. I assume most of you drove here in a car today. Could you have pushed it here? Well, a few, a few of you are really quite buff. I'm sure you could have, maybe with the help of some friends. But human muscles to push a vehicle here would be a great deal of work. It could be done, but it takes a lot of work. But a coffee mug's worth of liquid hydrocarbons derived from fossil energy sources, from ancient sunlight, compressed and, and uh, cooked up by nature for millions and millions of years, got you here. 50 miles an hour down the road for, for a long distance. Incredible energy density in fossil energy fuels. And, and that is one of the great challenges of moving a system that has been built around that fossil energy density to renewables, which are much more diffuse, harder to capture. 
every material artifact, this podium, the projector, all the clothes that we're wearing, everything, everything that we use has embodied energy in it. It took energy to manufacture, to maintain, will eventually to, to dispose it. And certainly that, that is also the case with many services as well. To try to analyze the embodied energy in a particular object, there are certain methodologies that one can use, and people have done this for appliances and the like. You could pick up your cell phone and you could try to think, well, what did it take to get the rare earth minerals from Africa and the plastics? What about the manufacturing facility in China? What about the advertising agency that needed to inculcate desire for it? Um, and all of the transmission infrastructure and the cell towers that make it work, not including the electricity to, to recharge it. If you were to do that sort of life cycle uh, audit, you would see that there's a lot of embodied energy in that one little cell phone. And all of those systems, again, that scaffolding of civilization have to be in place before you can make just the one call. And it's also, it's kind of interesting to think about your, if you were to try to really analyze that, where are the boundaries of consideration? What, where do you stop? Because once you start, you can think, well, there was the plastic in the cell phone, but what about the machines that made the plastic? And what about the machines that mined the oil that was converted into the plastic? And what about the workers there and what they ate for lunch and the tractors that grew the food that they ate for lunch? You see, pretty soon you're auditing the entire scaffolding of civilization. The boundaries of consideration are endless. The demographer Joel Cohen has estimated that prior to the invention of agriculture, the human population growth grew at about 1 500th of 1% per year. That is to say, for a very, very long period, for the vast majority of human history, human population was very, very stable. It grew extremely slowly. The birth of agriculture, that ticked up by a factor of 10, but it was still a fraction of 1%. Where that hockey uh, graph, hockey stick graphs, really starts to spike up is at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and this exploitation of this one-time windfall that nature provided to us of fossil fuels. Now, while population growth has increased by more than seven times since 1800, energy use per capita has increased by more than 30 times. And that has allowed a dramatic, dramatic increase in economic activity. Every non-renewable resource eventually must peak and then decline. And if you think of the aggregate of that, you, can, you could measure a single oil well when it meets its maximum production and then goes down, or a group in an, in an oil field, uh, or any collection of resources. But they all eventually go through that production peak curve. The US oil production of conventional oil uh, peaked in the early 1970s. Globally, production of conventional oil peaked in 2005. Now, you can only tell in hindsight where that peak was, possibly it could increase again, but it's been stable since then despite a very, very high energy prices, and it is unlikely that conventional oil production will ever uh, significantly increase again. In any case, with population going like this and conventional oil production going like this and a slight uptick in unconventional, the per capita availability of energy resources is going like this already. The era of cheap abundant oil in any case is over. We hear a lot about green energy and the explosion of use and interest in renewables. That's really exciting. It's terrific. But if you look at where we are right now, if you look at the pie chart, the overwhelming dominance in the energy mix is still fossil energy. All of, uh, you know, you get oil at 34, coal, 28, natural gas, the only significant renewable energy uh, in, the, in the mix, in the generating mix, is large-scale hydropower at 6%, and then about the same amount as nuclear power. Energy sprawl is a factor of the total quantity of energy produced and the land use intensity of its production. So the energy sector's footprint keeps on increasing particularly as you move down the hydrocarbon chain and you start to go after those more diffuse renewables. 
And if you're thinking about the, the kind of the area impacts of that, you also have to factor in the systemic impacts from, from transmission and refining and all of the, the, the infrastructure that's related to getting energy to society. After agriculture, it's very likely that the energy sector is the single largest land use on the planet. Now, what constitutes ugliness is a matter of personal opinion. And what constitutes visual blight is certainly controversial. We would certainly have differences of opinion in this room. But for my part, I think ecological integrity and beauty are deeply connected, that there's a fundamentally intertwined relationship there. Uh, I can't express it nearly as well as the brilliant writer Sandra Lubarsky, who's written, if the word sustainability means something more than mere survival and perseverance, then we must speak of beauty. For beauty is the value that is intrinsic to the ecological paradigm. No, that's not photoshopped. That's an actual working oil well outside in the front, the front yard of the capital of Oklahoma. And I think it, it pictures, in a way, encapsulates these characteristics of this current energy economy that it is centralized, not distributed, that it's primarily scaled for corporate profit, not community values, that it is intrinsically destructive of both beauty and biological diversity, that, and this is important, that it assumes perpetual growth. The current energy economy assumes perpetual growth. And, uh, and then finally, that it's anchored by fossil fuels. Now, I've mostly you know, been talking here about fossil energy resources, but the same sorts of energy fundamentals also pertain to renewables. Mega dams, large-scale hydro, mega dams are river killers. They're wilderness destroyers. A solar PV generated power is fantastic, it's great, but, and it's in really decreasing in cost, but it has key limitations, most uh, importantly intermittency. It has a fairly low net energy ratio, and if it, it's sited uh, poorly, like this array, this industrial PV array, it displaces natural habitat. Concentrated solar thermal installations, similarly, they represent a huge amount of embodied energy in their construction and their maintenance. They are, again, centralized generating facilities that were scaled usually for investor-owned utility profit, and they destroy natural habitat. Same issues apply to industrial scale wind factories. Wind factories, they are not farms. They are not wind farms. In the Northeast, we see that wind developments now are being sited primarily on mid-elevation ridgelines. Well, what are these places? These are among the last strongholds of wild nature in the region. These were the places that, for the most part, weren't farmed. Agriculture didn't get there. Uh, and so they have been in a forested condition, even though logged, uh, for thousands of years. They are now subject to intense industrial development in some places. And it's interesting to me, um, I was a co-editor of a book a few years ago on mountaintop removal coal mining in Appalachia called Plundering Appalachia. It's interesting to me that the exact same techniques that are being used to decapitate mountains in Appalachia are now being applied to the northern Appalachians to create industrial wind development pads, including blasting with explosives. So when it comes to producing energy for this ever-expanding global economy, whether it's from fossil fuels or renewables, ecological and social impacts are inevitable. So why is this new era, this era of extreme energy, as, as Michael Clare uh, has, has uh, described it, so dangerous? Well, again, let's recap. One, a techno-industrial economy that seeks perpetual growth is dependent utterly on this continuous supply and increasing supply of highly energy dense fuel resources. And two, the best of the best of that is already gone. The sweetest, easiest to get crude has already been tapped, the easiest coal veins to, to get, it's already been gotten. 
Most of the world's uh, super major oil fields are already in depletion, and thus you get the increase in unconventional oil production with tar sands and shale oil and the like and fracking for shale gas, all of those things trying to pick up the slack. Those unconventional resources have a lower net energy ratio, so you have to do more of that activity to stay in the same place energetically in terms of output, deployable to society. And those lower grade resources in the hydrocarbon family, particularly tar sands, uh, have a higher or larger ecological footprint to produce than even than conventional oil or natural gas. So in sum, you get energy sprawl and visual blight accelerating. Now, on that happy note, <laughs> if that wasn't daunting enough to try to overturn and flip around that toxic energy economy toward a future energy economy that looks very different, of course, the energy sector is just one, one part one factor driving this global eco-social crisis, the great unraveling of, of natural communities and place-based human cultures. We might be sitting here tonight talking about industrial forestry or industrial agriculture and its destruction of ecosystems. We might be talking how the industrial mindset applied to livestock has created this whole system of animal concentration camps. We might be talking how, about how industrial aquaculture is a growing threat to coastlines and befouling the seas around the globe. Everywhere we look, we see a culture. We see a culture that is not teaching reverence for life to its children, but instead is socializing children to think of the planet as a giant playground for our toys. We see how an industrial mindset makes it acceptable to persecute wild creatures especially large carnivores that we, like uh, mountain lions and wolves, that we think are, are uh, uh, negative to our interests or hostile to, our, to ourselves. So how did it come to this that we've, we've gotten ourselves into such a rat's nest of ecological and cultural decay? Now, we obviously don't have time to really dig into that tonight. That would take um, a, a big, vigorous talk around a campfire. But arguably, we can say at least briefly, that the roots of this global eco-social crisis go way back, way deep into human history. And some folks like to point to the adoption of pastoralism when we started domesticating wild creatures as our species fall from grace. And others will say, well, no, it was really the Neolithic Revolution 12,000 years ago when we invented agriculture. And clearly the rift between nature and humanity really took off, began to accelerate with fossil-fueled industrialism. Some people like to blame the world's ills on mass consumerism and globalized corporate capitalism, and others point the finger at militarism for the growing war between nature and people. And what about denialism? <laughs> denialism. How some corporations, this would be funny if it weren't true. This is an actual billboard outside Charleston, West Virginia. It really exists. It's not Photoshop. How some corporations and the politicians who serve them will really just lie with impunity to prop up the status quo. That surely is a factor too. But beneath all of those isms that I just listed, there is another ism, perhaps the ultimate ism. And the worldview that springs from it, which is the heart of the problem. Anthropocentrism, human-centeredness, this idea that our species is separate from the rest of creation, that we're sovereign over the rest of life, that we're Lord man, we're the decider, planetary edition. I, I saw that ethic of entitlement perfectly encapsulated not long ago in a Hummer. This giant SUV with a vanity license plate that read, living for me. <laughs> it was just perfect. It was perfect. And I do have to say, thank goodness, I did see it in Vermont. It was New York plates. <laughs> Everybody in Vermont eats local food and drives a Prius. Absolutely true. But Mr. New York, living for me, really got it right on his license plate. It's all about people. So what is the antidote to that? What is the, the elixir to 
help heal the arrogance of humanism. Wildness. Wildness. Or specifically, the humility and the restraint that comes from valuing wildness, which, of course, Thoreau reminded us is the preser is in the in wildness is the preservation of the world. Wildness, that creative force which created us and which produces and shapes biodiversity, requires space to flourish, and that space is wilderness, the arena of evolution. Now, there is a group of academics now on the ascendancy who like to claim that we've entered the so-called Anthropocene, the age of, of man, age of human dominion, and that there's no such thing as wilderness anymore, no such thing as pristine wilderness. If it ever existed, it's all gone now, and we're in the driver's seat. And when they claim that there's no part of the earth that's wholly untouched or virginal, uh, untouched by human behavior, they're, of course, they're, they're technically correct. But the word pristine, the word virginal, do not exist in the Wilderness Act. They do not appear because the defining characteristic of wilderness is not virginity. It is freedom. It is freedom. Wilderness is where nature is free to direct the ebb and flow of life. And in America, now we're getting to the hopeful part the prettier pictures. In America, we have a 150-year-long tradition of protecting self-willed lands, parks, and wilderness areas, nature sanctuaries, wildlife refuges. We call them different things. But the point is self-willed lands. And the conservation movement that began to address self-willed lands and as the habitat of self-willed creatures arose to an earlier environmental crisis. This wave of settlement and deforestation that swept across this region that left these hills of New England scalped, butchered, the rivers running brown with silt, and left the prairies of the Midwest so littered with the skulls of bison that it was profitable to gather them up and ship them back east into great mounds next to the Detroit rail yard where they could be ground up into fertilizer. And the wing of the conservation movement that came to focus on self-willed landscapes initially began with utilitarian arguments that these protected areas would be fantastic places to provide scenic beauty and recreational opportunities. Those were later joined, however, by ecological arguments that wilderness areas would sustain biodiversity and were the backdrop for natural processes to operate. In the 1920s, Alda Leopold and others began to uh, advocate for designated wilderness areas on federal public lands, initially primarily for recreational purposes, so they could sustain the, the pioneer skills and the hunting and the fishing opportunities in wild country that they loved. But later in his life, Leopold would begin to write about how wilderness would be a, a scientific control, a base datum of normality, he said, that could help us understand the land community, the land organism, and therefore do better at stewarding the managed landscape that we must domestic domesticate to live. In the 1930s, uh, Robert Marshall began advocating for the creation of a new organization which would become the Wilderness Society that would fight uh, for self-willed lands. And when he was agitating for that creation, he wrote, there is just one hope of repulsing the tyrannical ambition of civilization to conquer every niche on the entire planet, on the whole earth. That hope is the organization of spirited people who will fight for the freedom of the wilderness. So even in the 1930s, Bob Marshall recognized the trajectory of modernity, that its nature, its intrinsic direction was or he called it tyrannical ambition, was to conquer every niche on the whole earth. Now, the modern wilderness movement certainly articulates how protected areas are crucial for countering climate change and for preserving wildlife habitat and future evolutionary possibilities. So saving wilderness is no longer just about a, a nice place to hike or hunt or paddle, although it remains all those things. It's also about preventing extinction. The ultimate argument, however, the ultimate argument for conserving wilderness is because wild places and wild creatures, 
simply have a right to exist for their own sake, regardless of their utility to people. That is, they have intrinsic value. Now, while that idea is more prominent in wilderness advocacy today, it's easy to say that this theme of intrinsic value stretches way back to the writings of John Muir and Henry David Thoreau. We can see it there if we look. Now, let's think about this. This is something kind of interesting. This is something new under the sun because these other important social change movements in American history, the fight to abolish slavery, the fight for civil rights for people of color, the right to achieve the vote for women, all those important social change movements were about extending rights to formerly marginalized categories of people. But the wilderness movement, when it moved beyond utilitarian arguments and began to articulate the intrinsic value of nature and self-willed lands and self-willed creatures, essentially expanded this sphere of ethical concern to all the members of the land community, including, if you happen to be in grizzly country, to members of the land community that can eat you. That's a remarkable thing. And it's especially remarkable when you think that that attitude, which would be common sense in any indigenous culture, that attitude emerged from social activism in a society that historically and still today views the world, how? Primarily through the lens of economic opportunity. Can I mine this place? Can I farm it? Can I log it? What can I take from it? How can I profit from it? Who can name that, that painting? Westward, the course of civilization. Close, but no. John Henson Mitchell, no. Anyone else? Manifest Destiny. Close, no. Free copy of uh, Wildlands Philanthropy or Energy or cor any, any book in the, in the collection for the first period. Oh. American Progress is the name of that painting by John Gast. And I love this painting because it so perfectly encapsulates, encapsulates this idea. Those pesky indigenous people swept aside so that the plowman and the miner and the telegraph could come along. Those pesky indigenous self-willed creatures swept aside by this sort of embodied uh, lady uh, uh, with the star of empire on her forehead in grave danger of a wardrobe malfunction, uh, <laughs> making the world safe for American progress. American progress was painted by John Gast in 1872. And in an amazing irony, Michael Kellett, what happened in 1872? Yellowstone National Park. The world's first national park in the same year that this painting was done. All right, so what is the connection here between strategies to address the extreme energy era and this fight to protect wildness? Let me draw a few lessons. First, uh, the activists fighting climate change right now have a lot of energy, particularly the youth. There were thousands and thousands of them a week ago in Pittsburgh at uh, this year's Power Shift conference. But if you looked at what those workshops were, you saw a lot about green energy and a lot about environmental racism and not a lot about nature. So I would suggest that the climate change movement might well take a cue from the wilderness movement in realizing that these things are primarily and fundamentally about seeking justice, seeking justice and equity, but not just for the human community. A second, the response to a toxic energy economy is not just more efficiency, not just more conservation, not more enlightened uh, energy policies, more low carbon emissions uh, generating capacity in the energy mix. All of things, those things are crucial. They're all necessary, but they're not sufficient. I would say that ultimately a deep overhaul, deep structural change, not mere tinkering, tinkering around the edges is necessary. The future energy economy that we seek would turn today's on its head, 180 degrees. It would be decentralized and distributed, not centralized. It would be scaled primarily to support community values and not corporate profit. It would always, always sustain beauty and biodiversity, and it would be anchored by renewables. Now, getting there is a big lift, and we will get there 
only by incremental reforms, but we need to keep that end goal, that end goal in mind. And I would suggest that ultimately to get to that place, we have to challenge that idea, that pernicious idea that has shaped the current energy economy and informed our modern relationship to nature. And that is that the answer to this problem of anthropocentrism is a philosophical revolution that replaces, entirely replaces this idea of human dominion with one of community and communion and reciprocity. Well, how do we do that? The wilderness idea can help. The wilderness idea helps us learn this lesson of humility, helps us exercise our restraint muscles. It helps us get over the notion that this earth uh, is merely a collection of resources for, for humans to exploit. And it helps us remember that we are plain members and citizens in the biotic community, not lord and conqueror of the planet. Wilderness, the idea. And wilderness, the place. Lots of them. Self-willed lands, securing more self-willed lands in whatever formal designation, in national parks, in, uh, in other kinds of protected areas, in federal wilderness areas, in state uh, natural areas. All of those places are crucial to fend off because they help keep at bay until it is overturned, keep at bay that toxic energy economy, that era of extreme energy that would seize every potential resource for human use. And I've in almost entirely avoided statistics in these remarks, but I will give you one, and it's a powerful one to think about. By some studies, deforestation and degradation of primary ecosystems, that is to say, wilderness destruction, is responsible for more carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere every year than all the cars and trucks on the planet. Which is to say, you cannot solve the carbon emissions problem while still continuing to destroy wilderness. So wilderness the idea and wilderness the place. And the good news, now we're getting to the hopeful part, is that everybody can help do this. Everyone in this room, every acre, every acre saved for freedom and wildness and beauty and health is a victory. Places like this, the uh, Northeast Wilderness Trust's Alder Stream Preserve, help advance us toward that energy future that we want. Everyone can part participate. When the folks in southern New Hampshire uh, worked with the Wilderness Trust to protect this place, this wonderful Wapak wilderness, they wanted to save their views. They wanted to save their community character. They wanted to help sustain a very special school for um, interesting kids. But it had the side effect of helping sequester a whole lot of carbon in forest soils that will help fight climate chaos too, both biological and climate uh, victory there. Every parcel that the Wilderness Trust helps secure in the, in the uh, Split Rock Wildway that's either protected, protected as forever wild by the trust or flipped into public ownership in the forever wild uh, forest preserve in the Adirondacks is safe, is safe, at least for now, from an energy economy that still too often sees the trees as fuel, as something to chip and burn or chip and ship and ultimately burn. And this is a really hopeful thing, that those of us, like the people in this room, who are not energy wonks, who may not have the inclination or the capacity to get into the thick of trying to get the state legislature to pass a group net metering bill, or try to get the federal government to pass a climate change bill or a carbon tax, may not want to dig down into the weeds of energy policy. There is still something we can do, and just beyond making good choices about our personal consumption and, and, and insulating and getting the caulking guns out in our house, we can help push back, respond to this era of extreme energy by saving wild places. Wilderness conservation is this real, tangible, hopeful work to do this. It's something we can do. Every incremental step, every acre saved help us move, helps us move toward 
that future day when the human energy economy mirrors nature's energy economy, which is to say that it is elegant, without waste, 100% solar powered, where beauty abounds where beauty abounds. I began these thoughts with wisdom from 26 centuries ago. I'll conclude with wisdom from our own day. Barbara King Solver writes, people need wild places to be surrounded by a singing, mating, howling commotion of other species, all of which love their lives as much as we do ours, and none of which could possibly care less about us in our place. It reminds us that our plans are small and somewhat absurd. It reminds us why. In those cases in which our plans might influence many future generations, we ought to choose carefully. Looking out on a clean plank of planet Earth, we can get shaken right down to the bone by the bronze-eyed possibility of lives that are not our own. I am so thankful to you for uh, grateful to the Thoreau Institute and to Kathy for uh, letting me be with you tonight. I've enjoyed it very much. But even more than that, I want to thank you for all that you have done, uh, all that you are doing, and all that you might do to protect wild places and creatures, all those lives, all those lives that may well be affected by our plans, that are being affected by the current energy economy those lives which are not our own. Thank you. <laughs>